Dear fans, it is my great pleasure to have the opportunity to say opening remarks at the annual meeting of the Finnish Institute in Athens. Brave pioneering Finnish scientists were studying and exploring the Mediterranean already in the 19th century. It was deemed essential that Finns know and understand history and art of the classical times. Several translations of classic antique literature into Finnish were made, and important copies of several Greek pieces of sculpture were acquired for both the University of Helsinki and the National Library. This represents, in my mind, very well the mentality and the sentiment Finns had at that time. It has always been vital for us and our country to strengthen our links and connections to Western civilization. In fact, For a small country like Finland, international cooperation and networks have always been the recipe for success. This is true for all sectors, politics, business and the academic world as well. Finnish institutes fulfill an important part in forming and developing our relationships with other countries. Cooperation between universities and research institutes open possibilities for academic professionals and students alike to share information and material. Sharing the results of the work done by Finnish researchers is another important element that the institutes around the world have. Finally, I want to thank the Finnish Institute in Athens for the work it has done in the past year, which has not been an easy one for any of us. Let's hope that the next season will be the one where we reunite, re-establish friendships and connections, replenish and restart in a pioneering spirit once again. Thank you. Your Excellency, dear friends, colleagues, dear partners in cooperation, members of the board and dear co-workers, the valued staff of the Finnish Institute at Athens, welcome to the 36th annual meeting of the Finnish Institute at Athens. Ini megali mohara ke timi na sa skalosoriso apopse sti triakosti ekti etisia sinantisi tu Finlandiku institutu atinon. Da itele na arhiso efkaristondas kapius antropuski peresies pu voitesan tu erko tu Finlandiku institutu atinon ton telefteo chrono. Arhika telo na efkaristiso derma to ipurgio politismu ke atletismu και τις εφορίες αρχαιότητων που είχαμε τη χαρά να συνεργαστούμε. Ιδιαίτερες ευχαριστίες στην κύρια Άννα Καραπαναγιώτου από την εφορία αρχαιότητων Αρκαδίας, στον κύριο Γιάννη Χουλιαρά και την κύρια Γεωργία Πλιάκου από την εφορία αρχαιότητων Τεσπροδίας, στις κύριες Τέλα Χρυσουλάκη και Άντα Κατούλα από την εφορία αρχαιότητων Πυραιός και Μιζών και Αναστασία Τσιγουνάκη από την Εφορία Αρχαιότητων Ρετουμνών. Ελπίζουμε να συνεχίζουμε την συνεργασία μαζί σας σε σύνδικες πιοκανονικές, αφού ξεπεραστούν οι δυσκολίες που έχει προκαλέσει η πανδημία. I wish also to express the warmest thanks on, on behalf of the Institute to the other scholarly institutions in Greece, in Finland and elsewhere, where we have had pleasure to work with during a report period. I arrived in Athens in the beginning of February as a new director of the Institute and landed to a full lockdown. Without the wonderful staff of the Institute, both in Athens and in Finland, my task would have been much more difficult. And hence I wish to express my heartfelt gratitude to my knowledgeable colleagues and dear friends at the Institute and at the neighboring Institute for all the help they have provided me with during turbulent times when we all have learned to live with much more shorter-term perspectives than before. We also at the Institute wish to extend our thanks to the staff of the Nordic Library, who has been most helpful and resourceful, even when the library has remained officially closed to the public. We are much looking forward to cooperation also with the Embassy of Finland in Athens, with gratitude for the work that we have done together so far. Lastly, but definitely not least, at the Institute we are especially grateful for the generous and invaluable financial support 
by the so-called support delegation of the Finnish Institute at Athens, Tuki Delegatia, as it is in Finnish, without which it would not have been possible to carry out many of our activities, particularly those relating to archaeological fieldwork. In these pictures you see a brand new minibus financed by the delegation maneuvering into the Institute's garage on a rainy February day. The term 2020-21 has been a time of changes at the Finnish Institute. Not only have our staff been obliged uh, to postpone, cancel, reschedule and alter our entire program, or most of it, and uh, including field campaigns, due to the well-known reasons caused by the pandemic, but they also have had to get used to working with new faces, as it is. Manna Satama, the long-serving General Secretary of the Foundation, finished in her position, and Tina Purola joined our forces in the role. And my predecessor, Dr. Pion Fossen, completed his term as the director of the Institute in the shift of the year. I take this opportunity to thank Björn for his important work at the Institute. Tonight, my report covers most of the activities that took place during his tenure. I'm also very happy to welcome Dr. Antti Lampinen to continue his excellent work with us as the assistant director during his soon beginning extended tenure at the Institute. The activities of the Finnish Institute fall into four main categories. Research, including archaeological fieldwork, education, publishing work and cultural activities. All aiming to carry out and promote the study of Greek archaeology, history, language and culture from ancient times to the present day. In the end of January 2020, we had our last public lecture in the old form, in the real life as it is. It was an event organized together with the Swedish Institute at Athens and given, a little ironically, by myself on the topic of skins and leather production in ancient Greece. We are looking forward to continuing our well-established and fruitful collaboration with our Swedish colleagues, as well as with the other Nordic institutes in Athens. A new era of distant communication started at the Institute when also parts of our program went online. There was, however, one event that we were able to organize in the real life in, in autumn when corona restrictions were for the most part lifted. It required, in fact, strong physical presences, namely the so-called Mainalia Stromas Road Run event was run for the second time in October 2020 to promote knowledge of the ancient Mainalian games on the foot of the mouth Mainalos in the area where one of, of the Institute's excavation sites is situated. Situations with difficulties have also a silver lining, as they often do, and the quiet months of virtually no or only very few residences at our hostel house the Colonneos building, have provided us with a possibility to carry out renovation and decoration works. This year marks 20 years since the building was inaugurated, and now it is ready to welcome guests again, with fresh appearance when the corona restrictions so allow. We also used the lockdown months to renew our internet homepage and gave it a more user-friendly form. The pandemic has brought us closer to our fellow scholarly institutes in Finland, Institutum Romanum Finlandia, known as Villa Lante in Rome, and the Finnish Institute in the Middle East, in Beirut, particularly with whom we have organized joint online events open to the wider public. One example you see here on the picture, it is a seminar on translating ancient texts organized together with Villa Lante, which will in fact take place tomorrow online. Everyone interested in translations of Latin and Greek text into Finnish are of course warmly welcome. Also with the frame of the foundation of the Finnish Institute, we have been together with the other three Finnish scholarly institutes abroad again. We have been a part of the program which aims at digitizing research data and materials as well as providing up-to-date frame for open access publishing of scholarly data and results. Three online events were organized to discuss and publicize the results of the program. Manna Satama, then the General Secretary of the Foundation, completed a pilot project where recently excavated archaeological materials from the Institute's excavation in Tesprotia 
were transferred to an openly accessible database platform. This pilot provides us with a model for future digitizing and open access publishing of the archaeological materials. Cultural events have probably been most affected by the pandemic. Together with the other Finnish institutes abroad, we have nevertheless promoted a new, larger program for artistic proposals related to the themes of resilience in the face of the pandemic, societal innovation and accessible art practice, which encourages collective and socially responsible artistic projects that are developed with minorities and or with underrepresented communities. In the publishing front, the staff of the Institute has been busy with translating the results of the earlier started research programs into Greek, as well as producing Greek translations of Finnish literature. Our valued member of staff, Maria Marzoukos, translation of Max Sieg's best-selling psychological thriller in English, uh, The Witch Hunt, was published in 2020 with the title Ginigos Magison. In addition, a volume concerning the Finnish experiences of and narratives from the Greek Turkish War of the year 1897 has been under preparation by Björn Forsen and Maria Marzuku. And this book, entitled Psema ke Apati, Finlandiston Elina Turki Kopolemo, Stu Hilja Oktakosia Enenintaepta, will see the daylight very soon. Institute's traditional introductory course to ancient Greece was cancelled in 2020. But this year's course, planned to take place in autumn, will be extended in terms of student numbers to compensate the cancelled course and to get us back to, to our teaching program. I'm going to turn next to the reports, our fieldwork campaigns. Since no fieldwork was carried out in 2020, under the direction of the former director of the Institute, Professor Jari Pakkanen. He takes this opportunity to report on the progress of the publications connected with the three-dimensional development program of the Institute and the urban landscape of Naxos in Sicily. His report is as follows. The cityscape project at Naxos in Sicily has concentrated on a thorough re-evaluation of the whole urban territory. The project has been carried out as a part of the research collaboration agreement between the Museum of Naxos and the Finnish Institute at Athens. The third partner of the project has been the Finnish Institute in Rome. The project directors are Jari Pakkanen and Maria Constanza Lentini. The fieldwork at Naxos has three main aims. Documenting the architectural remains unearthed since the 1950s, carrying out geophysical prospection inside the city walls and excavating new small-scale test trenches. The documentation projects at Naxos have been very closely linked with the 3D development program of the Institute. The settlement was the first Greek colony in Sicily, founded in 734 BCE by Oikists from Chalkis on Evia and Naxos in the Cyclades. The outline and methods of the three-dimensional development program of the Institute have been discussed in several recent publications. So the next few slides give a very brief idea how the program has been beneficial to the archaeological projects which have been associated with it. This picture here shows documentation of the shipset complex at Naxos taking place in 2016. Photogrammetry has been an important part of three-dimensional recording from the beginning of the program. The blue squares show where the individual photographs were taken. The shipset complex is between houses inside the town, so no drone photography was used, only a handheld digital camera. The results of photogrammetry is a highly accurate geo-referenced model. In post-processing of the fieldwork data, it's possible to combine intensive three-dimensional line drawing of individual blocks with the photogrammetry model. We use reflectorless total stations, so the laser beam can be directly used to document the features. The picture here presents the total station survey superimposed on the site ortho mosaic, and the different faces are marked with colors following the period classification in general used at the site. The late archaic walls are drawn in orange. The north wall constructed as part of the classical remodeling is green. 
and the late Roman wall is Zion. In the present picture, the total station line drawings are integrated with a dense point cloud of photogrammetry model. The three-dimensional reconstruction is the northwest corner of the ship sets covers covering the parts of Slipways 1 and 2. Two new collaborative publications were written last year. The first of them having been published in April this year. The publication includes new works uh, on the topography of the settlement and discussions of the first colonial settlement, the Agora, the Shipset Complex, the Southwest Sanctuary, and the results of the geophysical prospection. The first report on the 6th century well was excavated in 2015 and 16. It is soon about to be published. The classical well is the first fully excavated one inside the city walls, and it has a depth of over six meters. The top part of the pithos covering the well was discovered when a protective roof was being constructed in 2014. The original idea was to carefully excavate the inside of the pithos for organic remains. In the picture on the left, the excavations are just being started in 2015. When the work progressed, it was soon clear that the pithos had no bottom half at all. The top covered a solidly built well constructed of stones. The excavated layers and the well were documented using photogrammetry and a total station. The publication of the finds concentrates on the highly interesting finds from the bottom of the well. Only the bottom layer, 45, reflects the period when the well was in use as a water source. A large part of the pottery in the lower layers can be dated to around 500 BCE, but there is a significant number of later vessels from 450 to 400 BCE. The rare bronze coin from Piakos dates to the last quarter of the 5th century. The latest material confirms that the well went out of use at the end of the 5th century, quite certainly when the city was destroyed by Syracuse in 403 BCE. Several vessels in the lower layers have a hole. Examination of the traces of the punctured holes shows that the intentional perforation was carried out with a sharp blow to the object. The number and good preservation of the punctured pieces of pottery suggests that the act was done on complete vessels just before the deposition of them into the well. The two layers above the punctured vessel contain roof tiles from the house and they give a possible indication of the chronology of events. Namely, the tiles were quite likely placed into the well to seal off the deposit after the destruction of Naxos in 403 BCE. A set of knuckle bones was discovered in the same layer as the punctured vessels. Several are abraded and one still has the lead filling in place. The most widely recognized function of astragals in antiquity was as caming pieces and protective amulets, but divination using a set of astragals, astragalomantea, was also practiced. The possible practice of astragalomancy in archaic Didyma has been recently studied in detail by Alan Greaves. He did empirical tests on throwing astragals from different species of animals and compared the results between modified and unmodified sets of bones. And he discovered that the ancient modifications resulted in more evenly distributed sets of results. The context of the vessels at Naxos strongly indicates that the astragals in layers 43 and 44 were used in divination and that the seven astragals in the slide shown here constituted a single set. Considering the archaeological material and the historical sources, a hypothesis for the occasion of this deposit can be suggested. After the Syracusan sack in 403 BCE, a group of people gathered in the courtyard of a destroyed house. They bring along a set of astragals and a large collection of pottery, most of them already a hundred years old pieces. They ask for an oracle. The astragals are cast and the results is interpreted. The astragals are then discarded into the well. An offering is made to the tonic deities. The bodies of the liquid containers 
and the bottoms of the cups are pierced with a quick blow from a sharp object, and they are also carefully lowered into the well. The sacrificial objects are then sealed off using roof tiles and other debris from the destroyed house. The group then leaves and never returns Naxos, following the advice of the oracle. Then we turn to Dr. Bjorn Frosen's report on the works on the Des Desperodia expedition 2020 at Kefirakia, which reads as follows. The Desprotia expedition is an interdisciplinary project which, apart from an intensive archaeological and geological survey, is part of the Kokites Valley in Desprotia and has included also trial excavations in locations of special interest, as well as balloonological, geophysical, epigraphical and archival work. The main field season of the project, directed by Björn Forsen, were organized between 2004 and 2010, and after that, focus mainly has been put on the study and publication of the finds. The volume in the final publication series, Desperodia Expedition No. 4, Region Transformed by Empire, appeared in early 2020. The project has also produced five master theses and one doctoral dissertation. Further dissertations are in preparation, such as the work by Nikko Suha on Hellenistic fortifications and by Tommy Turmo on rural sites and productions during the Hellenistic period. The picture shows the site of Kefirakia as located approximately seven kilometers to the south of Paramitia on the east side of the Kokitos and land belonging to the village Brodromi. Part of the site was uncovered by a rescue excavation conducted in 2000-2001 by the 32nd effort for prehistoric and classical antiquities in Igumenitsa. The surrounding area was later in 2006 studied by intensive field survey as part of a Desperodia expedition thereby revealing a small late classical to early Hellenistic village, apparently consisting of at least five to six buildings. The best preserved of the buildings uncovered by the Ephoriate is located at the southwest edge of the village. Here, several phases of occupation were detected, the building apparently remaining in use until the late Hellenistic period. Permission to study the finds from the excavation of this building was given to Tommy Turmo in 2015. A small supplementary excavation of the best preserved building at Kefirakia was organized under the direction of Björn Forsen and Tommy Turmo in August 2020. The aim of the supplementary excavation was to gain a better understanding of the surviving structures, their building techniques, chronological sequence, and above all, the function of a complex water channel system running through the site. The number of people working in a field was limited to only five due to the safety regulations and issues related to the COVID-19 virus situation. With the help of the effort of antiquities in Desperotia, the surviving structures of the building were cleaned from vegetation. Smaller trenches were opened in order to reveal the foundations of the architectural structures, whereafter the remains were measured with the help of a total station and extensively photographed with the aim of creating photogrammetric images. The excavation provided a lot of new information. The deeper trenches reaching below the foundations established the beginning of activities at the site to the late 4th century BC. The channel system and the rectangular room were found to be contemporary, dating to the 3rd century. The bathroom with the multi-layer waterproof floor and the ceramic bathing tub in the southern corner was investigated in detail and dated to the second century. During the excavation, we discovered a previously unknown train construction in the eastern corner of the room, which was built to clear the water from the, from the floor. The discovery of the train also confirmed that at this point, the channel system was no longer in use. On the basis of our work, we could confirm that the site continued to be settled at least until the late second century BC, thereby also during the decays following directly after the Roman destruction of Epirus in 167 BC. 
The supplementary excavation gave us new information concerning the stratigraphic sequence of the site and thus will enable us to date the various building stages more accurately. Among the finds could be mentioned a well-preserved unguentarium with red black blip and a large fragment of hopper mill from volcanic stone seen here. The results of the work will constitute part of Tommy Turma's dissertation and appear as part of a planned fifth volume of Desprothia expedition. This year, 2021, is the year of celebration of 200 years since the Greek War of Independence. 2021 marks also 2,500 years since the naval battle of Salamis. Finnish Institute has an archaeological field program at Salamis, together with the Ephoriad of Antiquities of Piraeus and I Islands. This is one of the reasons to bring the theme of Salamis to the fore at this annual meeting. It will be crystallized in the annual lecture to be given us this evening by John Papadopoulos, whom I'm going to introduce now. Tonight's speaker, John Papadopoulos, is Professor of Archaeology and Classics with the Kotzen Institute, University of California, Los Angeles. He received his PhD from the University of Sydney, taught there, as well as worked in Athens as the deputy director of the Australian Archaeological Institute until 1994, when he took the position of the curator of antiquities at the Getty Museum. Since 2002, he has been a professor at UCLA, serving both as chair of classics and chair of the archaeology in the departmental PhD program. John's areas of specialization within archaeology of Greece cover a great chronological variety. From the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, archaic to the classical periods, they also cover the archaeology of colonization, the integration of archaeological and liter literary evidence in the study of the past, to name just a few. He has excavated widely in Australia at Aboriginal and historic sites, but especially in Greece, yet also in Albania and in Italy. He joined the Taroni excavations already in 1979 and directed the excavations later for nine years till 95, and more recently also co-directed the long-standing ancient Methoni archaeological project. John has held numerous fellowships and educated a generation of classical archaeologists, being a very inspiring and admired teacher. Professor Papadopoulos is extremely prolific scholar who has authored, co-authored and edited 13 books and over, written over 100 articles on a great variety of topics. What we have learned from John is that we should not take anything our studies for granted, were it a meaning of an object that turns out of the ground in an archaeological excavation or an ancient text or an image, our own tradition or indeed even what we see. He shows us that there is always another point of view and directs us to look deeper. And this, to look, to see, to view, to a new direction, is what we will hear tonight in John's talk entitled Framing Victory, Salamis, the Athenian Acropolis, and the Agora. Welcome, John. Thank you, Petra. Um, αγαπητοί φίλοι και συνάδελφοι, κυρίες και κύριοι, η διάλεξή μου θα παραδοθεί στα αγγλικά, αλλά ήθελα να πω λίγα λόγια πρώτα στα ελληνικά. Με μεγάλη χαρά είμαι μαζί σας απόψη, παρόλο που είμαι ένας κόσμος μακριά στο Los Angeles. Αν και θα είμαι μαζί σας στην Αθήνα τον Ιούνιο. Για σας, πάτε βραδάκι, για μένα το άγριο ξημέρωμα. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω την Πέτρα Πάκενεν και το Φιλανδικό Ινστιτούτο για αυτήν την πρόσκληση και χαίρομαι που βλέπω ψηφιακά, αν όχι προσωπικά, τα ονόματα τόσους πολλούς φίλους. What I want to talk about this evening is one of the most amazing ensembles of architecture ever built in world history, and I'm talking about the Acropolis. And the building that I'm really going to focus on is Propylia. Uh, but I want to begin a little bit with the Parthenon to make a simple point. Now, there are many monuments, and they're really all over the world, 
that are what I would refer to as monuments of national importance, monuments that are metonymic. That is, one sees this building and one thinks immediately about Greece. And there are many of these buildings, Statue of Liberty, Eiffel Tower. <laughs> There's many also in antiquity, of course, Stonehenge and the amazing pyramids of Giza in Egypt. And they're literally all, all over the world, Teotihuacan, Machu Picchu, Colosseum in Rome, or the Great Wall of China, or of course, Angkor Wat. But before returning to Athens, I just wanted to also make a, another simple point, which is a building like the Parthenon has had a huge impact on later world architecture. There is, in fact, a scale replica of the building in Nashville, Tennessee, that you see on the bottom right. And on the left, two views of the Supreme Court of the United States. And yes, it has Corinthian capital, it's not Doric, but it is very much based on the design of the Parthenon. So let's spiral um, into the heart, as I like to call it, of the classical beast. Uh, you see the buildings in this uh, model, you see the dates of those buildings. This is something that I don't need to go over. Uh, many of you know about this. But the Propylaea was the second building uh, that was built after the Parthenon. It was begun in 437 BC, and it, it was completed, although some details, as we will see, are unfinished, in 432. And then, of course, the other important buildings, there are many others, in fact, uh, but they include the Eric Theon, uh, which was the latest, and the little temple, of course, of Athena Niki. In Plutarch's life of Pericles, he states, and I quote, as the works rose, shining with grandeur and possessing an inimitable form of grace, and the workmen strove to surpass one another in the beauty of their workmanship, the rapidity with which they were executed was especially marvelous. For the projects, each of which they thought would require several successive generations to reach completion, were all being completed together in the prime of one man's administration. For that reason, the works of Pericles are even more admired. Who built in a short time, they have lasted for a long time. For in its beauty, each work was, even at that time, ancient, and yet in its perfection, each looks even at the present time as if it was fresh and newly built. Thus, there is a certain bloom of newness in each work and an appearance of, having, of being untouched by the wear of time. It is as if some ever-flowering life and unaging spirit had been infused into the creation of these works. Idias directed all the projects and was the overseer of everything for him, that is, for Pericles, although there were great architects and artists employed in the works. The Hecatompedon Parthenon was executed by Callicrates and Ictinus. If only Plutarch could be with us today to see how important his words remain two and a half or 2,000 years after his own life. Here is a wonderful early photograph by the American photographer, William Stillman, 1869, showing the Propylia, the Propylia. You also see uh, the little temple of Athena Niki as it was reconstructed at the time, and you see the approach, uh, the Western approach to the Acropolis. Really want to talk about this evening is this incredible relationship between this building and the island of Salamis. Now, there's been a great deal of discussion on the position and the alignment of the Great Propylaea in relation to the Parthenon and other buildings 
of the Periclean and Caimonian building program. Now, some of the things that have been published uh, include, and I, and I state, uh, first of all, as laid out, the building is almost as wide as the Parthenon, but not quite. There are similar ratios of the two. One is three to seven versus the other being four to nine. It's close, but it's not there. And the third is that although they're on the same axis, they don't share exactly the same orientation. Now, I think in many respects, our view has been affected by what I would like to call, uh, together with my colleague, Samantha Martin Corliffe, misguided frontality, almost the fetish of frontality. In some cases, like the one you see on the screen here, this cannot be helped. This is Maxime Ducamp's wonderful photograph of Abu Simbel taken in the middle of the 19th century. If we take the Parthenon, the preferred view is not the front of the building, but the back. And I dare say that most visitors to the Acropolis believe, or modern vi visitors that is, believe that the back is the front. This goes back to the earliest photographic image we have, um, this is actually an engraving after the daguerreotype, the earliest photograph of 1839, taken by Pierre Gustave Jolie de Lotinier. Um, and it's one of this is the earliest photographic image we have of the building. It also goes back to the earliest illustration we have in captivity of the Parthenon, uh, which shows the West back facade by Syriac or Kyriakos of Ancona. Um, and the drawing is dated to 1436. It's also what we see in Dodwell's painting uh, of Athens at the time when Elgin stole the Acropolis marbles. Here's another photograph by William Stillman. And again, it is the back side of the building that predominates. Why? I'd like to think that a good part of it has to do with this new formal approach, Nesaclean propylaea. One of my favorite paintings, I just love to look at this. This is the Acropolis of Athens as it was envisioned at the time of Apostolos Pavlos in the first century AD by the Bavarian neoclassicist Leo von Klenze. Um, it dates just about the same date as many of the early photographs we have right to the middle of the 19th um, century. And again, you see this important relationship between the portal and the big building standing. Here's Demetrius Constantine's photograph of the 1860s. You can alter the angle but the back still remains the preferred view. And look at this photograph of 1880, and let's compare it back to this, and you can see the big changes. And this is Constantine Athanasio's 1880 photograph. Um, these are all taken from the Hill of the Muses, uh, Philopapos. Um, and it's something that continues to this day. This is Martin Parr's wonderful photograph of tourist groups uh, on the Acropolis in 1991. We all think we're looking at this, when in fact, we're looking at this. But let's return to the Propylaea. And before we interrogate what is front and back, a few facts. The building, although ostensibly complete, has a few details that are unfinished, and they include lifting bosses, and you can see these on the right-hand side of the screen, and also the protect working surface on the steps and floors that were never removed. And I show you details here on the right. Um, this area would have been removed after, and this was never done. And again, you see some of the uh, lifting bosses on the left. D.S. Robertson, 
the great architectural historian, the father of the great Martin Robertson, who wrote a history of Greek art that many of us still refer to today. Um, you see on the left his restored plan in gray of what he thought the original building was aimed, was designed to look like. And the red that I've outlined shows what Nesicles actually built. And the two are, are, are rather different. Among other things, if you actually extended to what D.S. Robertson thought, one corner of the building, the, um, the southwest corner, would have been in the air, more or less, right at the very edge. This is what the great Robertson had to say about this building. Are in some respects the most interesting and impressive to us of all the Attic works of the fifth century BC. And they were greatly admired in antiquity, end of quote. Nesicles built the building in the 430s. Their name uh, made of pentelic marbles, and ever, as I've mentioned, not completely finished. And the reasons for this couldn't have been very convincing, partly through religious conservatism was one reason, another one partly through the financial stress of the Peloponnesian War. But if you look at the dates of the building, it actually is more or less completed before the Great Plague of Athens. Moreover, the southeast corner of the southwest wing of the Propylaea is nicely beveled to fit the Mycenaean wall that's about a thousand years earlier. Now, were I an Athenian, I would be loath, in the classical period, I would be loath to destroy the late Bronze Age wall for various reasons, not least of which is that I still believe that this was the only fortification wall standing in Athens when the Persians sacked the city in 480. See, I don't believe in a separate archaic perivolos. I've laid this out in an article. What about this nicely image? Well, I think it was intentional. That's exactly what Nesicles wanted. Moreover, the temple of Athena Niki, and you see the foot here, and this is the little Naiskos that's still visible today if you can get permission to go underneath. If you look at the Naiskos underneath, the archaic Naiskos, and the altar of the Temple of Athena Niki, they are directly facing this stretch of the Mycenaean Wall. And sure enough, part of this wall may well have been rebuilt in the classical period. Here's a nice um, photograph of the area. And again, you see the lifting bosses. So here's the curtailed plan and its relationship with the temple of Athena Niki that you see here. Here's the Mycenaean wall. And the other thing that's really important is that Nesicles changed the entire orientation of the building. The original Propylaea, which you see here in this drawing, this square, was facing more towards the southwest, and Nesicles turned it. Now, in turning the entrance to the Acropolis, he had to build a whole new ramp. It was a ma massive undertaking. And this has, to my mind, never been adequately explained. There's no doubt that the Propylaea is this liminal area between the secular outside, the city of Athens, and the sacred interior, the sacred rock. And although, there, although unfinished, there is, as far as I believe, a certain beauty in its asymmetry, which I think can be explained. Now, I think our problem has been that the focus has been a very internal analysis of the buildings on the Acropolis and how they relate to one another. 
It's a wonderful ensemble. In contrast, the external elements of the building program have been relegated to issues largely of approach, as we see in this wonderful watercolor uh, by Peter Connolly. It's the primary approach for all visitors, citizens, their families, metics, and others. And if you look at the accounts of a, a, a important tourists like Le Corbusier or Sigmund Freud, um, it's amazing what this building meant to these uh, pioneers of modern architecture and also of psychoanalysis. The building is primarily seen as a termination, that is, of the Panathenaic pro, uh, procession, and also a prelude, a prelude of what you would see once you enter the Propylia. And this is uh, Gorham Stevens' 1936 reconstruction, which tries to give an idea of what the visitor would have seen entering the um, the Acropolis. Now, ancient authors greatly admired Apollaeum. For Plutarch, as we saw, it was the building program as a whole that was important. Pausanias, writing in the second century AD, describes the roof of the Propylaea in the following terms, and I quote, the formal entrance has a roof of white marble, which, down to my own times, is still incomparable for the size and beauty of the stone, end of quote. For earlier authors, the Propylaea were perhaps admired even more than other buildings. And we see this in Demosthenes against Androsian and also uh, in against uh, Aristocrates. In describing the great monuments of Athens, Demosthenes twice lists the Propylaea first and the Parthenon second, while in Against Aristocrates, he mentions the Propylaea without any reference to the Parthenon. Similarly, Aeschylus, when urging the Athenians to recall the great achievements of their ancestors, singles out the Propylaea, not the Parthenon. And Cicero in De Ophicius, citing Demetrius of Phaleron, provides a critique of the sumptuousness of the Propylaea. Whatever later generations thought of the Periclean building program, the Athenians themselves greatly valued the Propylaea. What's been overlooked is that a monumental entrance is also a monumental exit. And it's this that I want to focus on, more particularly an early photograph of the Propylaea that you see here by Adolf Braun. Uh, it dates to about 1890. It's a massive photograph. It's um, 77 centimeters by 61 centimeters. Um, and it's a sort of photograph that you can literally fall into. Here it is in relationship to other early 19th, uh, uh, other similarly early 19th, second half of the 19th century photographs that are of a large size. You see a solitary scale figure toward skirt guardian who leans against a pillar in this very symmetrical brawn view, looking outwards from the Propylaea. In the center, in the distance, and look how clear Athens was in those days, a sliver of water glimmers below what are just usually described as distant mountains. These are not mountains. This is divine Salamis. Upon exiting the Acropolis, Salamis is in your face. Just as it forms the ceremonial gateway into the Athenian Acropolis, the passageway out of provides every visitor a reminder of what was a watershed event in the history and topography of Athens. The defeat of the Persian Armada in the Battle of Salamis on a late September day in 480 BC. Had there been no Salamis, 
no victory at Salamis and Marathon, there may never have been a democracy in the modern world, or so argued John Stuart Mill. It was in the critical period following victory at Salamis that the social, political, and architectural reforms of Chemon and Pericles irrevocably transformed the landscape of central Athens, sweeping much that went before. And here is a portrait, a photographic portrait of John Stuart Mill. So when the penny dropped, in my own head about this exit, framing victory at Salamis. I did what any archeologist would do. I rushed home and I went straight to Google Earth. I dissected the line of the portal of the Nesiclean Propylia, and I took it out kilometers, many kilometers towards Salamis, and look at what it does. Exit of the Acropolis through the Propylia frames Salamis itself. It looks to the mountains of the island, but also to the horns of Salamis as well, but also to something more. The line directly splits the Kinoshura Peninsula and the islet of Sitalia, where 400 Persians were stationed. And it was on the end of the Kinoshura Peninsula that the Athenians built their victory monument after the battle. So here is the battle, um, some artist reconstructions. And in a minute, uh, here's another view, and I've got a third view, but in a minute, Andreas will take over the screen and show you a short clip of the battle of Salamis. So because I'm in Hollywood, I couldn't, I couldn't resist showing you that clip of that dreadful film. Um, I'm not sure if Artemisia and Themistocles had sex before the Battle of Salamis. I'm pretty sure that horses did not feature in the Battle of Salamis. And I know for a fact that the Spartans did not come and save the day. But the important point is that Salamis was a watershed event. And upon exiting the Propylaea, the whole process is essentially experiential, with Salamis becoming clearer and clearer into view. By the time you're at the two outermost columns of the Propylaea, you can see virtually the whole island. Now, there are various types of victory monuments, and the little temple of Athena Niki is no exception, with the Battle of the Greeks, uh, perhaps even the Battle of Marathon, and of course, on its bastion, the little holes, many of which are still preserved today, on which Cleon's, uh, the shields that Cleon took from the Spartans at Sphacteria in the 420s were set up. Now, the exit of the Propylaea looks onto Salamis, and in so doing, it frames the Athenian victory. Architecture as an active framing, as an active agent, frames victory. As a war memorial or as a victory memorial, it is, however, not alone. Here is this wonderful drawing, of course, by my colleague and friend Manolis Corres, showing the uh, column drums of the pre Parthenon built into the north wall and also the architecture of the archaic temple of Athena, Polyas. Now, it was these spoilia built into the north wall that were clearly seen from the classical agora, which, as I've argued elsewhere, uh, back in 2003, almost 20 years ago, is not an agora until after 480 BC. The classical agora was thus an integral part of the Caimonian and Periclean building program on the Acropolis. And it's in many ways reciprocal to the Acropolis, but also part and parcel of the same building program. You cannot have one without, without the other. 
It's like a game of tennis. You can't play it by yourself. The rebuilt Acropolis North Wall is, unique, is a unique monument in Greece and truly remarkable for its understanding of the power of ruins on the emotions and imagination of people. And it was consciously constructed to do so. The other thing is the little caryatid portico of the Eric Theon has its toe, as it were, pointing to the archaic ruins of the temple of Athena Polias. You see the portrait of the maidens here and the plan of the old temple. So let's start treating the Acropolis and the classical Agora as part and parcel of the same building program. There is more to the relationship of the Acropolis and the Agora. The Stoa Poikili, the painted Stoa, it housed several important paintings, as well as shields taken from Spartans and others. The paintings include the Battle of Inoi, the battle between Greeks and Amazons by Mycon, uh, the Ilio Persis by Polygnotus, and the Battle of Marathon by Peninus. And so it too is a victory monument in itself, but there is more. It's one specifically cited to view the Acropolis North Wall. It is, in fact, just about the only point in the area of the later classical Agora that you can see the column drums of the pre-Parthenon, the architrave of the temple, and little temple of Athena Niki. And the whole Acropolis is, as Jeffrey Hurwitz so nicely put it, a vast and intricate dissertation on history. So this is what the Stoa Poikili, or part of it, looks like today. See here. And this is a reconstruction by my colleague and friend, Samantha Martin Corliff. Um, and it was every bit a memorial as other well-cited buildings. And the reasons are, incredible. Why was the Stoa Poikili built in the floodplain of the Eridanos River? One corner virtually in the stream bed of the river itself. And this is the coring work, of course, of Al Ammerman and his colleagues, uh, which has shown this, I think, very clearly. For this work, the Eridanos had to be channeled, which it was. The reason was it's the best viewing of the North Wall of the Acropolis, which you see here again. What various stoas did in the classical Agora, which after all was only an Agora after Salamis, was to provide viewing angles onto a Persian War Memorial of the sacrilege that the Persians had done in destroying these buildings. In the same way in which the Propylaea captures for eternity the site of the greatest Athenian naval victory. And I very much agree with John Stuart Mill that there may not have been a modern democracy had the Athenians been defeated at Marathon and Salamis. And this, I believe, also uh, uh, leads us directly to Roman portals. And here, of course, I show you the most famous of the Roman portals in Athens, the Arch of Hadrian, which, coming at it from this side, proclaims the city of Theseus. There is the city of Theseus, right where I believe the old Agora, the archaic Agora, was located. But that's another argument. If you turn around and go the other way, you enter the new city of Hadrian and the wonderful completion of the Temple of Olympian Zeus. A similar game is being played by the Roman Agora, the Forum of Caesar and all 
Augustus, and particularly the great Athena Archegetis, which, as you can see in this early photograph, is archaeizing. It's built directly on, it's built directly after the proper layer. And if you look at what it communicates with, it actually forms a termination, the entrance and the exit to the street, which communicates back the classical agora, which at this time had become museum of sorts. And this is exactly what happens with Roman arches in the city of Rome. On the left, the Arch of Titus it was built by Diocletian in AD 81 to commemorate the Jewish campaign of Titus in 71 AD. Now, of course, you cannot see Jerusalem from Rome like you could see Salamis from the Athenian Acropolis. But no problem, the Romans actually carved reliefs of Jerusalem. So it's playing that same game. And on the right, of course, the Arch of Constantine, uh, built in AD 312 to commemorate the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. One of my favorite books, and if you haven't read it, it's been translated into Greece um, by, Mark Mat, uh, uh, by Mark Matsawa, Inside Hitler's Greece, The Experience of Occupation. It shows Field Marshal von Brautisch, shown around the Acropolis by the archaeologist, Nazi, and director, the then director of the German Archaeological Institute, Walter Rede, in 1941. Unlike the Persians who came to destroy, the Germans came not only to admire, but to appropriate. The symbolism is palpable. In order to take Athens, one has to take the Acropolis. It's symbolic. And in the background, the Acropolis doing what it always did, a monumental entrance and a monumental. On the night, and this is the wonderful plaque, which you will allow me to translate into English. On the night of May 30th, 1941, the Patriots Manolis Glesos and Apostolos Santas lowered the flag of the Nazi conquerors from the sacred rock of the Acropolis. And this was set up by the United National Resistance, 1941 to 1944. It was set up on the Acropolis in 1983. Memory and commemoration are powerful forces. Susan Alcock observed people derive identity from shared remembrance, from social memory, which in turn provides them with an image of their past and a design for their future. A member of the past fashions their sense of community and determines their allies, their enemies, and actions. They will argue over it and kill for it. Social memory is manifestly a powerful force, but also a fugitive. Memories overlap and compete. Over time, they change or are eradicated. People forget. In the 5th century BC, the Athenians not only commemorated, they embellished their city with social memory enshrined in stone, in bronze, in gold and ivory, and in paintings on wooden panels that the ancient Greeks referred to as sanites. The bronze statues, like the Promarchos, were destroyed, the metal melted down and reused. The gold and ivory cold statue of Athena Parthenos got long gone. So too the paintings and much of the stone sculpture is weathered and fragmented. Most importantly, however, social memory was woven into the very architectural fabric of the city, particularly on and around. It was through architecture, by means of individual buildings, and through the arrangement 
of different buildings together that the Athenians attempted to commemorate forever, for eternity, their victories and their glories, and to contextualize their memory within the landscape of their city. Thank you, your attention.